Happy morning's a new surprise. Don't know who I am before I roll bad ties. The option is the only thing that I decide. Hey everyone, it's Ivan, Kibadger.com, here today to talk about moto tats, or for the layman, motivational tattoos. Backing up, I got my first of two tattoos back in 98, fresh out of the school of infantry before I went over to my first duty station. I was super motivated and giving credit where credit's due. The Marine Corps is incredibly good at brainwashing or We'll soften it and call it conditioning. And rather than, well, I wanted to be different like everyone else. So rather than getting like a Bulldog or USMC 0351, whatever, and being indoctrinated into the Marine Corps and the warrior culture, I was like, you know what? I'm going to get this tattoo. Ended up going and getting this. Basically, Chinese character for warrior. At least that's what I'm led to believe. Who knows what it really means? But that was my first tattoo. That first tattoo, I put about as much thought as any 20 year old puts into something, even though it's gonna be permanent and there forever. But fast forward, and I was actually in the Air Force around 2006, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get another tattoo. So how did I end up with this guy? Well. This one I actually put a lot more time and effort and thought into before I got it. As far as this tattoo, number of elements. There's a Roman numeral 12 with a red one in there. And then around my forearm, it says Semper Fidelis. If you're not familiar, it is Latin, it means always faithful. Furthermore, it is the Marine Corps motto. That's on there for numerous reasons. One. I think it's pretty rad as far as mottos go. Always faithful. Two, absolutely a certain amount of pride in there with respect to my time as a Marine. And then also kind of tying in with that, the Marine Corps and stuff. One of my grandfathers, John, he was a, he was also a Marine. He was a Jeep ambulance driver with headquarters 1-1 back in World War II, like Okinawa, Peleliu, all that stuff. And he absolutely was instrumental in uh, probably helping mold me and some of the decisions I made, mentoring and stuff like that. So past that, we have the Roman numeral 12. Well, historically, that number is pretty cool, pretty awesome stuff with it, and I like it. Past that, though, I was born out of wedlock, a bastard, have two last names. Both of them start with the letter L. Well, twelfth letter of the alphabet is L and family is important to me and that's kind of the backstory on the 12. But that also leads us to the red one. For the red one, story time. So backing up to late 2001, basically, well, September 11th found me in over in Darwin, Australia. Long story short, we all got recalled to the ship, left that next morning, went out, ended up cutting grid squares in the Arabian Sea. Watched those first Tomahawk missiles get launched. Ended up going in, securing an airfield in Pakistan. Eventually, some people took over for us, went back to ship for like the worst Thanksgiving meal ever. And then we went into Afghanistan. And we were there for, I don't know, a solid month or so over basically December 2001, like through New Year's into the beginning of 2002. While there, we were down at Camp Rhino, which is like barren nothingness, like airfield out in the middle of nowhere, Southern Afghanistan, like desert, sand dunes, all that stuff. And we were securing an airfield there for basically people coming in and launching out of it like right at the beginning of the campaign. Some British SAS, they rolled in there with their vehicles, they cut out a bunch of different people. And as elements of that started to move up, there's basically this group. It was like the headquarters element, I guess, for battalion, first battalion. There was force reconnaissance, battalion reconnaissance to include Brad Colbert and kind of his crew, which later went on, super cool dude, but later went on, Jin Kill, all that stuff. 
and hang out on Libo and stuff like that. Cool guy. Uh, they were there. Some Army SF and then I guess first LAR, Light Armor Reconnaissance. So this conglomeration started moving north. They were going to go up and take the field up at Kandahar. So they were making their way north. Little ways into it, they're like, man, this sucks. We don't want to have to set up security every night. Like, while we're resting, we should get some infantry. So they ended up calling up some infantry to include some mortars and machine guns. Myself, my squad ended up getting selected as well as some other people, hopped on helos, flew up, met up with these guys. And so what would happen is at night, we would basically set up, we'd drive with them during the day, like just climbing onto whatever vehicles happen to have some space. A couple of my guys, we were riding with some SF guys, back of their Humvee, and we'd drive and then come nightfall, we'd basically dig in, we'd dig a bunch of fighting positions, we'd set up big 360 so everyone else could rest and sleep. Awesome, whatever. So we were doing this. So one night, starting to get up close, and there's a river going east to west, basically right below the MSR, this main road going between Kandahar and Lashkarga. So we're getting up close, and they were going to send out some LAVs to go basically scout somewhere that all these vehicles could cross the river. So get called back in. Lieutenant's briefing us, hey, this is what's going on. Tonight we're going to have some vehicles some LAVs, they're gonna end up, if you're not familiar, they're basically tanks with like six or eight wheels, I don't remember. And they're like, hey, LAVs are gonna go up, they're gonna scout a river crossing, they're gonna end up coming back. They're gonna be coming in front of your line. We we're over on the west side. They're like, they're gonna be coming in front of your line, just be aware. They're gonna come down and then they'll enter back from the south. All right, good to go. So go around, everyone's digging their fighting positions, go around and make sure everyone knows what's going on, brief my squad, brief the uh, machine gun section over on our side too, like, hey, this is what's happening, blah, 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 and sun starts going down. One of the perks of being a squad leader, get to sleep pretty much when you want. So again, made sure all my guys knew what was going on, hung out for a while, talking with one of the uh, other sergeants over in the machine gun section. And then eventually it's getting late, made one last round, chucked on all my guys, went back to my fighting hole. And my fighting hole was kind of right here in the middle and then over on either side, I had some of my guys, some of my guys further down, machine gun section over here, and went back to my little fighting hole. Went there, climbed down into my sleeping bag. I'm like, all right, set my watch. Like, I'll wake up in a couple hours, go make my rounds again, gonna get some sleep right now. So, lay down, start getting some sleep. End up with this crazy dream. And in this dream, I was back in the School of Infantry, back at Camp Horno, and it was raining. And of course, you get issued like the worst gear ever. We had these Gumby suits, which is like this rubberized canvas rain gear. And so we're just like, oh man, it's raining, we gotta wear these stupid Gumby suits. And someone's like, oh, hey, wait a minute, man. Like, we don't have to hike after all. Like, let's put our packs, let's just climb up on these LAVs that are right here. And it's like, oh, that's a great idea. I don't wanna hike anywhere with this stuff. And so we go to climb up on these LAVs. In my dream, I'm climbing up onto this LAV and I hear the rumbling, can smell these diesel engines. And then I actually wake up to the rumbling of a diesel engine. So I'm laying there in my fighting position. I'm looking up and this LAV is driving over me. And it's sand, right? So the sand is getting pushed down from like my little parapet in my fighting position. It was relatively deep, but it's just soft sand. And the wheel's coming down and it's like boom, boom, like coming down across my legs. And I'm trying to like squirm in my sleeping bag back this way out of my fighting position as this LAV is like rolling over me. And the last wheel ends up coming down like harder than the rest because there wasn't as much like supporting it. Ends up kind of bruising like one of my feet as I'm like barely out of 
essentially this thing's path. And this thing drives up over. At this point, I came out of my sleeping bag and yelling like every obscenity I can think of because super pissed, right? And this LAV stops because like the little Lance Corporal or whatever sitting up in the uh, gunner position popped up. He's like, whoa, hey, hold on. So the lieutenant jumps out of the vehicle, our vehicle commander runs back, probably afraid he's gonna get fired because he just killed some dude. And I'm super pissed, I'm swearing at this dude. Uh, Sergeant Law, the uh, machine gun section leader, he comes over, he's yelling at him too. And big picture, I was alive. What had happened though? Well, LAVs were coming down and near far recognition, basically my guys flashed their, basically the IR, like light, looking through their nods, like PVS seven Bravos or whatever. And it was like, hey, you, this is me, me, this is you. Cool. Obviously it wasn't anyone else. Nobody else had LAVs over there, but near far recognition per SOP and the vehicles had stopped. Of course, end of 2001, nobody has comms. Nobody can communicate with anyone. We don't have radios. There's like a radio dude with our Lieutenant somewhere back in the middle of camp. So these guys stop. We have no communication with them. They're like, Oh, maybe this is where the gate is rather than continuing down turning and then coming in from the South. So the lead vehicle turns, starts driving up and they're like flashing them again, no communicating. They're kind of like, what's this guy doing? And we're spread out because cold war doctrine, we're thinking someone's going to be launching mortars at us or whatever. So we have our correct dispersion. And so by the time they realize this guy's not going to stop, like, None of my guys from their fighting positions could make it over in time. And you're not going to yell in. Someone's going to hear you over the diesel engine of these things. And so this guy had to kind of gun it to get up over this little rise where I'd basically built my fighting position behind. So this guy's like halfway over my fighting position while people are trying to run out and like, oh, pretty sure Sergeant Loomis is over there. And so huge mess. Fortunately, again, didn't get crushed. After that, the other LAVs like, oh, maybe we should have a ground guide. Guys hopped out and they ended up like making it back into camp, went back to wherever they were gonna park for the night. Super huge mess. At that point, I was like, well, it's late. Guess, guess I'm gonna go back to sleep. Dug out my grenades from the sand and everything like that. Fortunately, it did not run over the AT4 and climbed back in bed and went to sleep. Woke up the next morning, started kind of taking stock and my pack frame totally busted. It was the cheap like Molly frames we had just went to. And one of the MREs in my backpack exploded from the weight of the vehicle. It was all over inside my pack. The, <laughs> my M16A2. It had basically shredded the fiberglass handguards like they were done. And so I'm looking at my rifle, looks like this laser gun, like no handguard on there, 20 inch barrel M16A2. I'm like, okay. And that's what I had. We didn't have any spares or anything with us. So that next day I had to go basically test fire it and make sure this thing still worked took off my body armor, have it up, have the rifle in front of me, boom, break around, inspect my weapon and everything. I'm like, obviously it didn't blow up. I don't see anything pushing out. See this thing zeroed, break a shot, zero still on. So for the rest of my time, I basically had this laser looking gun. And yeah, we, got, we ended up back in camp later after we got heloed back. Of course, majors are like, devil dog, what's going on with your gun? I'm like, well, the handguards got broke off, got ran over by LAV. And they're like, oh, go see the armor. Eventually I got some new handguards, like right before we left, I think. But that was my gun for the lion share of that time. So where does Red One come in? Well, big picture, the name of that LAV that ran me over in my fighting hole that night in Afghanistan. 
its call sign was red one and so big picture the red one right here ultimately serves as a reminder of the blessed life that i lead that's the significance of it and that is the significance of this tattoo obviously a fair amount of time and effort went into kind of thinking about this one versus this one here but they're both part of me part of who i am and well at times i thought about actually covering that up i won't i don't regret it or anything like that this one i may or may not at some point end up just kind of freshening up make it look a little cleaner but this is what it is some people have asked, like, hey, what's the story on the tattoo? And, well, that's the story. Real quick, I do want to thank you guys who support me. I really appreciate it. Whether it's liking and sharing videos, picking up stuff over at kitbadger.com, whether it's patches, stickers, any of that other stuff, picking up t-shirts of mine over at Teespring, or especially you guys that sponsor me through Patreon. Really appreciate all that support helps me create content. But as always, thanks for joining us at kitbadger.com. Look forward to seeing you next time.